All right. Well, this is uh, such a treat for our community, both on campus and in the broader North Texas area, including right here in Fort Worth. Uh, I've been looking forward to this all semester. So first of all, just thank you, thank you, thank you for agreeing to do this and allowing us to, to uh, embrace your insights and ideas as we move them into action uh, as part of our Tandy Executive Speaker Series. Um, you know, one of the great things about our business school is that we, uh, because of the contextual backdrop of where we are located, we have a unique opportunity to operate a business school at the intersection of the academy and industry. And I think that's right for our students, and I think that's right for our businesses, and certainly for our entrepreneurs and, and leaders. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have outstanding support from amazing sponsors who are contributing to scholarships, to faculty support, to facilities upgrades, and on and on and on, everything it takes to run a business school, really, for the rest of the 21st century. And um, that is not lost on this specific event, our Tandy Executive uh, Speaker Series. So I wanted to take a quick moment before we get into the conversation to really thank our sponsors. Um, I know they've been flashing on the screen, but I think it's worth uh, uh, really recognizing our platinum sponsor for this event, uh, you know, Frost, the really great people at Frost Bank and their affiliated entities. Our gold sponsors, Esri, uh, the Fort Worth Business Press, which has been such a great partner, not only uh, financially, but also is helping us, you know, um, extend the narrative into the community of the goodness that's uh, resident here every day at the Neely School of Business. Our silver sponsors, Lynn Beck and the Balcom Agency, and our bronze sponsors, uh, Dunaway, Acme Brick, McDonald, Sanders, and BNSF Railway. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsors yeah. today. Yeah. All right, so uh, one of the things that I love about um, being the dean at TCU is that I don't have to just uh, be a dean. I actually get to uh, uh, teach. All right. It's very uh, often that uh, most universities don't let their deans teach. They're supposed to be out on the road fundraising or building brand or all these other things. It doesn't matter. Uh, but I get to teach each and every semester, and I teach wow. entrepreneurship, right? Woo. And so that's you. So uh, I'm really, really excited to um, uh, kick this off by saying one of the, actually the very first class, um, you know, every fall that I teach is about entrepreneurship nature versus nurture, right? Are you a born entrepreneur? Can you learn entrepreneurship? Can it be taught? Um, is it you know, part of the, the cultural milieu of, 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 of your lived life? And so I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about that question. You come from a, a family of entrepreneurs, right? So mm -hmm. tell me about that, that, that upbringing and sort of what gave you the courage to uh, have all the success that we just saw in the video. First of all, let me begin by, before I answer any question, yeah. with my gratitude. Um, it is such an honor for me to be here today with you. Uh, as a TCU parent, I want you there to know you that, uh, <laughs> thank you. And I guess we should just recognize the star right now, our Neely Fellow herself. She is here, my daughter is here in the audience. But it's really an honor for me, seriously, to have this conversation. Um, it's an honor to talk about my journey, and I, I love, love the intersection between industry and education, because that's where a lot of magic happens. In fact, a lot of my personal stories and successes have come from that intersection. And we can get into that later. But to answer your question, are entrepreneurs born or are they made? Um, let me, um, I don't, know if I have the right answer, but I certainly do have a perspective. And I believe that entrepreneurship can be looked upon as a continuum, <clears throat> right? It's not, are you an entrepreneur or are you not? It's where are you on that continuum? And your culture, your family, your upbringing, the people you surround yourself with move you more to the right or more to the left. So for me, um, I, to describe my upbringing would be really my answer. Um, my mother and father immigrated from Quito, Ecuador, South America, uh, to Los Angeles, California. I like to say I got to Texas as fast as I could. <laughs> um, so mom and dad moved from Quito, Ecuador. Uh, grandmother, grandfather were entrepreneurs. My mother and father found their American dream through entrepreneurship. Classic immigrant family. My father worked three jobs, slept four hours, my mother gave birth to six children, five are living today, very challenging upbringing, and they found their American dream through entrepreneurship. And not only, my, my, my father comes from a family of 12, and by the way, they're 
all entrepreneurs. <laughs> My mother comes from a family of three, but again, entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship was all I ever knew growing up. My aunts, my uncles, my tias, my tios, everybody worked for themselves. And more importantly, they worked together as a family. And so um, that is all I ever knew growing up. And so simultaneously, I was learning as I was growing up and digesting the art of what we call now risk-taking and perseverance and all these things that we know an entrepreneur needs. I was, I was, I was getting fed those subliminally throughout my entire life. And so it was only natural um, when I graduated. By the way, I'm the first to graduate from college in my family. And I, um, I, you know, my family circumstances were such that I was really blessed to be able to get a college education. And the very first thing that I did, of course, um, was seek out more opportunity. But um, my upbringing is essential to who I am today. And I, I think that every year that goes by, the older I get, the smarter I become, by the way. <laughs> um, and the older I get, um, the more awareness, acknowledgement, and really appreciation that I have for those early challenging beginnings. Because the video you saw right there are all the highlights, to be clear. If I had a video, um, of all the failures, it wouldn't be as entertaining, but I am here today um, with an open heart and an open mind to share that because I believe that people learn more um, through your failures than they do through your successes. And so having this conversation about the journey and all that I've learned, um, my only goal today is to be of value. I love it. I love it. Well, I mean, it's such a good fit, and we're—I think—we're kindred spirits. You know, what sort of the the guiding principle of TCU's Neely School of Business is what we call the Neely Promise, and it's embodied in one sentence, and it's to unleash human potential mm. with leadership at the core and innovation in our spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think you embody that um, to a T. And everybody that I know that knows you well speaks about your, um, your penchant for curiosity, <laughs> right? And your willingness to innovate technologically or otherwise. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, your, the, your curious streak and how that's led you to maybe even start Pinnacle and that, that it was. story. Yeah. It actually was. Um, so I mentioned I come from a family of entrepreneurs. What that means is you start working I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I come from a family of Hispanic entrepreneurs, which means you start working at the age of 10. <laughs> and there I was at 15 years old in my father's travel agency. And there's, this is a very young crowd back there, but um, out, out there, but there were days before um, we had the electronic ticket stock where we actually hand wrote our um, airplane tickets, believe it or not. And it, Nobody here is old enough to remember those days except for me. Okay, so um, I worked at a travel agency. My father owned the travel agency, and you used to have to call the airline. Can you imagine? You'd get on the phone, and you'd call the airline, and you were on hold, and you'd ask the price for this ticket. Then you'd call the other airline, and then you'd have a manual. It looked like the yellow pages. It was called the OAG, and that is how you would book. That's how a travel agent would book a ticket. You'd call the airline, you'd stay on hold for 45 minutes, you'd research, and, you'd, you, and then you'd manually write it. My father brought what was then a dumb terminal into the office. And when I saw what that computer would do, it was the Sabre system, by way, headquartered here in Fort Worth. It was the Sabre, the American Airlines Sabre system, and it allowed you to plug in through technology to the airline to the uh, to the airline and see what seats were available. It was like, oh. <laughs> so uh, for me, it it was an incredible, although a very small example, but at a very young age, I'm 15 years old, and I just saw a piece of technology that could eliminate so many manual process and streamline um, and streamline the business. And so I became very curious. And it, it had these things called shells, classes where you could teach yourself even more commands. And my sister and I were started racing to see who can memorize the commands more and who could book a ticket faster. And for me, that curiosity carried me because I saw that it changed, um, that it made in my father's business. Um, and I know now, 
looking back that entrepreneurs investing in that technological innovation. Today, Pinnacle, um, that curiosity exists. A lot of our innovation comes from using technology as an enabler to streamline process, um, to uh, support our scale. And so that's a curiosity that began when I was 15 and has carried through to Pinnacle today. Um, I took that curiosity when I graduated from college and I said to myself, I just want to be in this industry. That whole computer thing, that whole thing, I just, I don't know where or what. I don't have to be a scientist or a technologist. And I tell students all the time, you know, when it comes to STEM, you don't have to be right in the bullseye in the middle. You could be surrounding, you could be anywhere on the spectrum because any industry today uses technology. And so when I graduated from college, I took a job in New York City um, with a technology company that allowed me the awareness of the industry that I am in today. I love it. I love it. So building on that, um, that experience, that, say that first job, right? How did you transition from maybe a traditional you know, corporate role into you know, going out on your own and having a vision and you know, doing all the, uh, you know, the array of things required to, to, to take that plunge? I love it because people always say, what was your vision? How did you have a vision? I was 25. <laughs> right? And I, I'm sure on paper it says that I knew, I knew that in this century that technology, you know, technology and contingent labor would be so big. And, and let me just, again, we're here to learn and be vulnerable. Um, I did not. Right. So I worked for a, at the time, a $60 million privately held company headquartered in New York City. That was my first job out of college. And I did exactly what I was taught to do when I grew up. I worked hard. I was relentless. Um, in fact, that is one of my values, is hard work. I know how to put in the calories. I know how to do in the work. I know how to do the work. Um, I learned that in my upbringing. It is not just about having a dream, but you've got to be willing to prepare yourself to have it. And you've got to put in that work. And so I was the first one in and the last one out. And um, I, you know, I started with a cohort of 20, and I, I was one of the top producers. I worked my butt off. I was in New York City by myself. I took, um, you know, I'd worked till 9.30 at night, and I couldn't afford to live in New York, so I lived in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And so I did all the things that just I was taught to do, which is really lean in and work your butt off. And I caught the eye of the chairman. Um, again, if you're a performer, you catch the eye of, of leaders in the company. And so I was invited to kind of spin off a, a, a new division of the company, and I was in rooms, if I had to be candid, that I had no idea what they were talking about. But I was learning. I was absorbing. Um, I, I find that sometimes when you're young, you have to have the courage to be in that room, even though you're not a 1,000% prepared to be there. And instead of thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, what am I doing in this room? I don't belong here. Think, oh my gosh, what an opportunity. What can I learn? And so that mindset for me, um, my growth mindset has always been my calling card. And um, I very quickly uh, I, I very quickly realized the business in a couple of years, and it was it was before the World Wide Web. Oh my gosh, I'm aging myself. <laughs> this is before the World Wide Web. Um, this is back when you're calling and recruiting and you're attracting IT talent. It was when Wall Street was moving from mainframe to Unix. This is even pre-Microsoft, but I, I don't know how to explain this or put this into words, but my entrepreneurial background, my family, my culture, the house that I lived in is always about seeing opportunities, sometimes where people don't see them at all. Looking for opportunities, I'm looking for that gap, I'm looking for that slit in the door, I'm looking, I'm always looking, watching my parents fail, persevere, fail, persevere, I just, I naturally always look for opportunities. Today I get accused, um, you see opportunities everywhere, and I do. I'm just trained, I'm wired that way, I can't help myself. And so when I was in this industry, I recognized, <clears throat> this is back in the day of um, billable consultants at five, six, eight hundred dollars an hour. Of course, all well, that's been streamlined. But at the time, I was 25, and I saw nothing but opportunity. If I coupled that with the fact that 
I missed home. Mm -hmm. um, being a young Latina, moving away from family, um, I lost my father at a very, very young age, at 17, and so I was, um, I was kind of a, alone in a big place. It took a lot of courage for me to move from L.A. to Texas, um, where I knew no one. I didn't have a friend, and I knew I had to start on my own. And then I moved to, after I graduated, I moved to New York, where I didn't know anyone. I was alone. And that was very challenging for me, but I knew that in order to succeed, I needed to be uncomfortable. I, I, I'm not going to, I wasn't going to find success just being comfortable. And I purposely made myself uncomfortable and had the courage to be around people I didn't know, industry I didn't understand. And so I, I really, I ended up missing home. I went to the chairman at the time and I said, I really love working here. I love what I do, but I really miss home. Um, let me start your office in Texas. And he looked at me and he said, there's no future in Texas. <laughs> well, we know how that turned out. <laughs> and so I moved. I left, um, I left New York. I came to Texas in very short order. I was 25 years old. And I just decided that I was going to start this business on my own. I was super confident. I was young and single. I figured, what do I have to lose? I've watched my parents fail. I've been at rock bottom. I know how to live there. I know how to, I know how to move there. I know how to live there. Um, and I, I, just, I just thought that's exactly what you do. And so it's interesting because today, when you look at the Pinnacle website, our purpose is connecting people to opportunity. And that's why the company was founded. At the time, it was simply to connect me to an opportunity. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then it became my family. And then it became the Pinnacle Associates. And then it became our thousands of consultants. And then as time has evolved, it's like, why not the world? Why not? And so um, I've had so much fun answering this question. I already forgot the question. <laughs> There was a question in there somewhere, but uh, I, I, uh, that, is the, that is how um, I actually started, came to start the company. It had less to do with, oh, she was 25 and knew a vision and knew that the staffing index, index would, would grow. Um, it was more about my circumstances, mm -hmm. my curiosity, my entrepreneurial zeal, and my willingness to do the hard work. Well, um, we've talked a little bit about culture and your family and, and your circumstances. Um, so how has being a, a Latina business leader, right, how has that uh, impacted your career? And what are some of the challenges maybe uh, that you face as a result? What has been really uplifting about that as well? Uh, just contextualize that for us. Oh, goodness. OK, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite things to be, and that is underestimated. Yeah. Um, I relish in that. I have often been the youngest. I've been the first. Um, I've been the only in lots of rooms. I'm very blessed to have, have that situation in my life. Um, in a male-dominated industry in IT, uh, there are not a lot of Latinas um, serving on publicly traded company boards. I, I, actually, the statistic is one in a million, if, if you take the 50 million Latino population chop in half to 25 million, and there's probably about 25 Latinas sitting on publicly traded company boards. And so um, it, is, it has been a challenge to not see <clears throat> people that look like me with an incredible amount of uh, re like real power. And um, for a variety of reasons, oftentimes I was underestimated. But I actually love being underestimated. You know, I'm short, I'm small, I'm scrappy. Uh, <laughs> I am. I, I'm a triathlete, by the way. Oh, yeah. So I like to swim, bike, and run, preferably in the same hour. Uh, if you saw me walking down the street, you don't look at me and say, oh, she looks like a triathlete. I'm just, I'm underestimated. And that has, I, I, I use it to my favor. I take every situation where anybody else would, would have a victim mentality, and I turn it around and flip it and say, this is an opportunity for me. And so um, for me, I, I have had, I, I understand and recognize there are some challenges. Yes, I've been asked to serve a drink at a Mexican restaurant. One of my hair's up in a bun, and I'm, I'm actually a CEO. It's happened. 
But I don't allow those things to get me down. Um, I've been accused of being very positive. In fact, um, the strength finder will tell you that's my number one trait. Um, by the way, when I, found, when I found that out, I was very disappointed. <laughs> I really wanted something sexy and cool, like analytical. Who do we want analytical or competitive? And my husband got both of those, of course. And so, you know, we were looking at our results, and I was like, oh, I, I don't like my results. And I wanted something, like, strategic, you know, or, and um, we had to reveal in front of our management team. I'm going on a tangent, I know. Uh, I had too much coffee. And, <laughs> and I revealed mine, and mine was positivity. And I was like, <laughs> and my husband looked at me, and he says, of course you're positive. And I said, really? And he goes, that's one of the biggest reasons I married you. And I thought, oh, now it's coming together. Um, uh, but the reality is that my positivity, my mindset, my outlook, again, is something that I'm super proud of today. When you think of Pinnacle's history, uh, today we're the largest Latina-owned workforce solutions company in America. Uh, we're celebrating our 25-year anniversary and have a footprint in over 13 countries. That wasn't always the case. We were almost out of business after 9-11. We were super challenged after uh, the 2008 recession. And then COVID-19 was a huge punch in the gut. And that positivity, that mindset of moving and pushing forward has actually come in handy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm no longer um, upset about having that as my, as my number one trait. I'm actually proud of it. I think mindset matters. It's one of the most important um, pieces of advice I can give you if I were handing out advice this morning. Uh, mindset is what will move you and propel you forward uh, in many cases. And I already forgot the question again, but I have so enjoyed the answer. OK. <laughs> Well, let's talk about mindset a little bit. It's something that I teach as well. Um, and you, obviously, clearly, you have a growth mindset, and you, you're, you know, you're an optimistic person. You know, you're probably bordering on idealism, which I think is fabulous to get to bring people with you, right? Through yeah. uh, good times and really, in, in, in particular, tough times. Um, why, what about mindset? What are the kind of the, the characteristics of that? You know, what what can we particularly? We have some students here today. You know, and they're they're still um, maturing in a lot of ways. They're developing their approach toward the world, both professionally and personally. What more can we say about mindset? I, I think mindset really matters. It is one of my key, if I had a secret recipe on what you saw in the video, I would say that mindset is probably number one. How you view yourself um, is directly related to who you will become. And I'm speaking to the students. How you view yourself is directly related to who you will become. And if you'll indulge me in yet another story, I remember the question you just asked. It was about being Latina. Is it challenging? Is it hard? And for me, um, in business, uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, seventh, even eighth year in business, I didn't see people that looked like me. And I'm going to tell you a story that was fundamentally um, changed my life. I was sitting in a conference. Um, like this, slightly bigger. There were 2,000 people there. And a woman came on stage. Um, it was during uh, the Bush administration. And a woman came on stage, and she was a cabinet member. She was the United States treasurer, the United States treasurer. Her name was Rosario Marin. And she walked out in her beautiful black with gold buttons. And I don't remember what she said, but I remember how she made me feel. She was the highest ranking Latina in the administration, held a cabinet member, and I had never seen a Hispanic individual, certainly not a Latina, in a position of great power. It was the first time, and I was seated at the back of the audience. And I was just mesmerized. Like I said, I, couldn't, I don't know what she said, but I know how she made me feel. And since then, I have been a proponent of, you cannot be what you cannot see. And she spoke, and um, I was so moved by her words that after she, she was coming off the stage, I ran from the back of the ballroom into the, to the back 
curtain to try and like get a hold of her. I wanted to like meet her and touch her. And I remember they stopped me at the curtain. They're like, excuse me, ma'am, you cannot come here. And I, I, I looked at whoever was handling security that day and I'm like, I'm a Latina, I can do anything. <laughs> and, and he just kind of laughed and I just kind of scooted through and I walked up stage as she was walking off and I'm like, Madam Treasure, Madam Treasure, you know, my name is Nina Vaca and I just, I just want you to know you moved me today and I, 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 I raise money. You don't know who I am, but I live in Dallas, Texas and I raise money for minority students to go to college. And I was wondering if you would be our keynote speaker at our next get. Like here I am, you know, <laughs> fundraising, asking for the business. And I'll never forget, she kind of looked at me and she looked up and she looked all the way down. In those seconds where she was scanning me, I was like, oh, my heart was like squeezed. And she said, do you have a card? And students always have a card. Well, now you just whip out your phone and do your QR code. But um, at the time, I gave her my card. And you know what? She came to Dallas. And that little event, it, it, it was for the local Hispanic chamber. It was a Stars on the Rise program that I used to lead and chair. And um, that little event today raises $3.1 million for our students to go to college. Wow. Yeah. And by the way, I know that our Fort Worth Hispanic Chamber's in the house, so I gotta, get, I gotta give them a shout out. I know they brought their board members yeah. here today. And so I, I, I love that. For me, that increased my resolve. That experience increased my resolve um, to not just be a better business person for myself, for my family, for my company, but also to ensure that we are motivating and inspiring the next generation of women that look like us or may or are women uh, to show them that business is for everyone. Uh, business is for everyone. And people can, um, and for, so for me, that, that experience has been really um, impactful and life-changing. And it only took me 17 years, but 17 years later, I actually sat, um, I was able to be honored in LA at, um, at a gala where both of us are on stage and I got to tell that story. It took me 17 years, but we were finally together and today she's a personal friend. Oh, I love it, I love it. Well, you talked about a little bit about you know, broader impact um, and, and we believe that as, as well here at, at TCU in general and specifically in the Neely School of Business. In fact, the very first class that all business students uh, take is called business and society. Mm. And uh, the whole notion is to not just talk about business as a you know, vector for wealth creation, mm -hmm. but what a sustainable enterprise can mean to the communities in which it, it circulates. And obviously you have a ton of experience as both a civic and, and a philanthropic leader. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to us about how you uh, blend those two, right? The, the business leadership and then how you translate that into broader impact. Well, for me, um, again, going back, a lot of who I am, you have to go back to the mom, you know, back to the dad, back to the upbringing. Um, for me, uh, servant leadership is something I was taught. This, this is not just cultural, it was in my home, in my family, watching my mother give back. My father, I, I like to say, was the entrepreneurial one. So was my mom, actually, but my mother was a civic leader. And, um, she is one of the strongest, not just women, one of the strongest human beings I know. Uh, to watch her personal story is really inspiring. Now at the time, growing up, not so much, <laughs> right? But as you grow up and you gain awareness, um, my mother, by the time she was 20, she left her country and immigrated to the United States. By the time she was 30, um, she had lost a child. And by the time she was 40, she was a widow. Um, again, gave birth to six children, uh, one of the strongest women I know, never held a job in corporate America. And uh, what she was, was to me was an incredible activist. She taught me how to use my voice. She taught me how to galvanize people. She taught me how to get things done. Um, she has ideas. She's a visionary. And so I grew up with, with that. And so um, my mother, was never fully actually very impressed with my business success. <laughs> and it was kind of like, I, I, was, I was puzzled. 
I would go to the Thanksgiving table and say, you know, mom, I run a $10 million company. She go, ay, mija, que lindo. <laughs> okay, come back next year, come back the year after that, and the revenue kept getting bigger. You know, mom, it's $100 million. Ay, mija, que lindo. Don't forget to take out the trash. Yeah. And so she was never really fully impressed, you know, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. She's like, it Ernst again? Like, who's that? So she, <laughs> she is like, <laughs> she was, it, it's just, it, like that doesn't phase her. And I, I love that because for her, what impressed her, impresses her even today, what impresses her is what are you doing with your leadership to help others? And how are you utilizing your life to be a better global citizen and to help the world? Um, these aren't just words, I mean. So for me, that has been how I grew up. Um, she has inspired me to be involved. Um, <laughs> and the things that impress her are so not, the things I just told you about being on a public board that were really impressive. I'm like, mom, I'm on the Coles board. She's like, do you get a discount? <laughs> And she's like, what about the discount? And so she's just, you know, she only has been impressed with people. And, and she has taught me, by the way, I've had the opportunity, as you see, to hang out with a lot of celebrities, uh, legislative people, US presidents. And um, she taught me that, you know what? They all put their pants on the same way. Do not be starry eyed. Judge people not by their title, judge them by the caliber of their character. And what are they doing to help others? And so for me, um, to answer your question, that has been a lifelong um, journey for me. So when I started the company, it was only natural that I also wanted to help the community. And about two and a half decades ago, yeah, I started raising scholarship money. And um, I used to keep them very separate, by the way, what I did philanthropically and what I did for business. And as I, as, as, again, as the company matured and became a platform for good, and um, as the company matured and we are flexing our purpose of connecting people to opportunity, I also matured in bringing them together. And so today, the philanthropic work that we do is around STEM education. It's around that curiosity of getting students involved in technology. It's around entrepreneurship. It's all those things, and what a beautiful thing to be able to put them together. Yeah, I love it, yeah. I love it. Well, my next question uh, centers around what percentage discount you get at Colts. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, I don't even serve on the board anymore. <laughs> I, just had, I just had to, I just had to. Okay, um, so my next question is really, so yeah, you've uh, achieved so much, uh, you've been honored in so many ways, but one of the things that really spoke to me was being appointed by the White House as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about that, the experience, and oh, wow. I, just, I just, I love everything about it. Gosh, that was, um, that was one of the most amazing experiences that I have had. Um, a presidential appointment, and by the way, I was the only page ambassador that was not a household name. Everybody else, you know their name, Tory Burch, um, you know, Steve, uh, Steve Case, um, uh, um, uh, Damon John, uh, you know all the, 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 the page ambassadors had a household name. And so it was very intimidating for me to be the only one. And um, there's a story in there about the reason I was one, and this is a, perhaps a message to the students and, and, and to the uh, larger audience abroad. Always give your best and always do 100% because you never know who's looking. You never know who's watching. And um, I had someone recommend me. Uh, she happened to work for the Secretary of Commerce at the time and they were sitting, I'm sure, at the White House in some round room. And um, she raised her hand when they were selecting page ambassadors and they said, and she said, what do you think, what about Nina Vaca? The courage that that woman had um, is the courage that I now use in the boardroom today to advocate for women, um, is the courage that I now have um, to advocate for people who are not in the room. And so we, we, people like me that want to advocate, look for people 
that deliver. Look for people who are always doing 100%, who are always giving 100%. And that is how I ended up an ambassador. And for me, you know, writing Air Force One, uh, I went to Ghana, Africa, um, along with the Secretary of State at the time, um, uh, Penny Pritzker, and we're still friends today, was one of the most amazing experiences because it allowed me to take my love for entrepreneurship and what I was already doing on a local and national level and take it to a, a global level. And I visited uh, five different countries. I talked about entrepreneurship. I hope to inspire other women to start their businesses. It's one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. It's one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. I've never held a press conference. And, and I'll never forget the day. Penny's like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And I'm seeing like all these microphones and she's like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. And that's another message too. You will be fine. You know, again, putting yourself in these situations where you're doing things that you've never done and you're not 100% ready. Nobody took me to press conference school, right? Nobody took me to ambassador school. I learned on the fly, and that's okay. We just have to have courage to put ourselves in these uncomfortable situations and say, I am here, I am grateful for the role, and I am going to give the best that I have, and that is going to be enough. So um, that was an incredible, incredible opportunity for me to be able um, not only to espouse entrepreneurship at a global level, but if you saw in the video, I got to actually hand people their citizenship. I was a speaker at the immigration. Uh, my daughter came with me that day too. And I, um, it's, such a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to inspire people. In fact, I can't think of anything I love more than nurturing and helping people. I love it. Well, obviously, you're helping a lot of us here today and our students and our business leaders. And um, I, we're, I have one question I want to ask, at least before we take some questions from uh, the crowd, right? Because, okay. I mean, I've, I've got my own streak of curiosity. Oh, wow. But I really want to hear from, from you. And so I think some of our students are circulating right now. Um, if you've got a question, you know, scratch it out on an index card, and then we'll bring the crowd into it a little bit. But, oh, I love this. Uh, we've talked a little bit about your, your journey, your pathway, uh, your current success. Let's talk about the future just a little bit, right? Sure. So we've all been through some really tough times, right? You mentioned three at least, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's, it was 9-11, whether it was the Great Recession, whether it was COVID, right? right? Um, how are things changing? What, what's your, your outlook on the future? You know, whether it's a mega trend or things that, you know, are really, uh, you know, impacting the way we work today and tomorrow. You know, the one thing is for sure, again, I may or may not have the right answer, but I do have a perspective. <laughs> and um, I feel like the one thing that is for certain is things will change. I like to say they evolve. Um, People evolve, companies evolve. And so the way that leaders, I think, I would invite leaders to approach change is not looking in the rearview mirror, but like always looking forward. Sometimes after COVID, we have to resist the temptation to long for the days that were. If we long for the days that were, we can't focus 100% of our energy on what is to be. And so as a leader in my company, I constantly am focusing on what's forward, not what's behind us. You can honor where you've been. You can honor um, where you've, where, where, what you have done. But it is so important from a mindset to propel yourself forward to always thinking about what is the next version of the company? What is the next version of yourself? Oh, I love it. My best answer. Yeah. Well, um, when we were, we were talking before for this, you know, we, uh, a word came up uh, that I thought was really, really important, and that was hope. Oh, yeah. All right. Talk to us about hope and entrepreneurship and that intersection. Well, you, you heard me say in the video that hope and entrepreneurship are universal languages, and they really are. And for me, again, entrepreneurship has been my way of life. I think anyone can be an entrepreneur. Um, I fully believe entrepreneurs um, have to have an incredible amount of uh, resilience. Um, and while hope is not a strategy, it is fuel. Hope is never a strategy. You can never just sit there and hope things get better. Um, but it is fuel. 
And it's a very powerful fuel for me. Because when you have hope, it helps you fuel the energy to, again, put the calories in, burn those calories, and do the work. So when you couple hope with work, that becomes your success. You know, it's funny because uh, my daughters are here with me today, not just Kat, but Amanda's here too. And they have heard, um, you know, I've dragged them to, uh, to so many of these galas since they were 10 years old. So they could have that intersection between business and youth and learn because there's so much that you could learn. And I would always tell them, you know, growing up, I'd say things like, get in there and be someone, you know, or I'd say, put your back into it. Like, I'm washing the dishes, Mom. I know, I know but do it with intention, you know. So like, I always feel like putting in the work is the recipe, not being afraid to put in the work. I mean, I can't express that enough. Um, again, I mentioned I'm a triathlete. You know, I can't just dream of crossing the finish line of an Ironman 70.30. By the done, I, by the way, I've done that six times in three continents. Woot woot. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah. thank you. They, oh, there's an athlete in the room. I love it. <laughs> um, uh, that for me symbolizes putting in the work. I can't just dream about it. I've got to put in the work. And then here's the deal. Where's the map? Where's the workout? And so whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, hope comes first, work, and then the map. Oh, that must mean our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if that's the, the closing bell, but we've got, we do have a few more minutes. School and, is in session. That's exactly right. Um, we have, uh, okay, here's, here's the first question uh, from uh, our participants today. You've accomplished so much. Uh, we just heard a little bit about the future. What goals do you have for the year ahead? And when you're planning those goals, what's your approach to doing so? Ooh, deep question. Um, because um, you said, what do you plan for the year ahead? You didn't say in business. So I'm going to give you my whole oh, I love it, plan. Yeah. My plan for the year ahead is the same plan that I have had the last 25 years in business. And that is to gain more awareness about myself. Um, to utilize that awareness to propel me forward and to find my version of success. Because you see, business success to one may not be business, may not be success to the other. I just gave you the example of my mother, right? Of course, the easy answer would be, oh, scale the business, you know, um, scale the business, go into 10 more countries and call it a day. For me, that can't happen unless I'm changing myself. For the last 25 years, I have had to practically re think about it. I've had to reinvent myself in two and a half decades to become this 25-year-old know-nothing, because that's what, exactly what happened when I was 25, right? I just had my upbringing, my culture, my education, but I didn't really know a lot. To go from a 25-year-old young new CEO to a, a global CEO, a public director, a mother, a wife, a presidential ambassador, I am not the same person. I cannot be. And the company has been growing so fast. By the way, we spent 13 years on the Inc. 500, um, fastest growing companies in America. Um, we, we spent 15 years on that list, 13 years on that list. We were never the same company. And so I want to invite the audience, especially the students, to shed your skin every year, shed that skin, and constantly be in search of that, that better version of yourself. If you look back, you should be looking back and saying, wow, I've changed. Wow, I've changed. And that will continue even after college and hopefully during your business life. And so for me, those are my plans. Um, I feel like I, I heard this saying, and I, I really it was very moving to me. I think Carl Lung says it. He said, um, he who looks outside dreams, but he who looks inside awakens. And so when I turned the big 5-0 and 2020 caused me 
to really look inside myself. And when you awaken, uh, by the way, the truth will set you free. First, it'll piss you off. <laughs> um, but you can learn so much about yourself. And if I had to give you any, any advice is do not look at the, the saying, you know, know thyself. I think Confucius said it. Don't, don't look at it as a cliche. Like, really think about that. Know thyself. Like, who are you? What drives you? What is your vision? What does your heart say? Because when you figure that out, you're going to be firing on all cylinders. You're going to be firing on all cylinders. And so, know thyself. Oh, I love Those it. Those are my plans. All right. Well, maybe this next question is a little bit connected to that. Um, uh, and it's from one of our MBA students, so I want to make sure it, it gets heard. Um, okay. When you found yourself being the only Latina in a room, mm -hmm. did you ever experience imposter syndrome? And if so, what did you do to overcome it? <laughs> um, again, I said that I would come here to be vulnerable with an open heart and an open mind. Um, imposter syndrome is a thing, and yes, I have had it. I still have it. Um, it has been, um, I will not deny, it is a real thing. And when you think about it, as the youngest, I mean, I, I ran a business at 17, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. And so that circumstance allowed me to be the youngest and the only. And I started serving on public company boards when I was 39 years old. Um, my peers were a decade or 15 years older. They had ran businesses, large scale businesses, walking into these rooms. I mean, it's very stressful. Um, so yes, I think that there is a version of imposter syndrome that we all have when we walk into rooms that we're like, we think we don't belong in. Um, and this is where I exercise my courage muscle. I always view what can I learn from this situation? Like really? And so instead of being, um, I, well, I did what any normal person would do and I worked my butt off and I was overprepared and I probably worked three times as hard as the next person in order to be prepared, so there's that. Um, but the other thing I do is I, I try to, um, it's not what happens to you in life, it's how you relate to it. Any situation. It's not what happens to you in life, but it's how you relate to it. And so the way that I relate to that is again with a learning mindset. Um, putting your ego aside, it's not about ego, it's about outcome. What could I, ooh, maybe I could possibly learn from this. When I'm the only Hispanic in the room, there's no chip on my shoulder. There's like, oh, they just don't have awareness. Maybe it's an opportunity for me to educate them about our culture. It was really interesting going into a banking, by the way, environment where it's so formal and you're like kissing on the cheek. Like, you know, you know that's, that's culturally, that's how we say hello. Not in a banking environment. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so you, just that learning, that awareness, you know, um, but I have always been able to hold and control how I react to things. In fact, I always tell my children, you know, girls react, women respond. And I, I, I hope that they remember that. Whenever they want to panic and react, I hope they take a deep breath and say, Okay, this is the moment that that little, that 60 seconds that you have, you can turn it into two minutes. Sometimes you can turn it into a day if you need to. But do not react. That will never serve you well. Always respond. And so the way that I have responded to being the first, the only, the imposter syndrome is through an appreciation of um, what I have to learn and what I can do. I love it. Um, this next question. That's a long answer, sorry. Uh, it, well, an important one, and it actually it, 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 uh, dovetails really nicely with both this comment and then a question. It said that small business is the backbone of the economy, Yep. but the family is just as critical. Amen. How did you balance building your business and your family? With an angel as a husband? Yeah. Um, Thank you. There's, you know, we have, we got to appreciate our men. I love that. There's like one in the room. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> um, 
I, first of all, I come from a big family. There's five of us. I'm the middle child, but I act like the oldest. Um, I can act like the baby when I want to, too. I love that. I'm the chameleon. I'm right in the middle. And um, I love, so cherished, growing up in a chaotic big family. I loved it. I love being a big sister. I love being a little sister. And so I wanted that in my life. And today, women have to choose sometimes, like, oh, do I want the big family? Do I want the career? And for me, fortunately, God has blessed me with the ability to do both. So I had four children in six years while building the business. And I could only have done that um, with an incredible partner, mm -hmm. a life partner. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice I always give young women is who you choose as your life partner is such an important decision. And for me, I've been blessed to have someone who supports me um, and my hopes and my dreams, uh, who aligns with my values and has allowed me to, um, uh, to really raise a family, run a business, and um, do all the things that I can. No, I love it. I love it. Um, well, so we're, we're getting close to time, and I always promise everybody here that we'll get oh, you no, out of here by nine. Oh, went so fast. I know, I know. So maybe uh, help, help us close that out. Like if, uh, you know, I, I know you're very uh, invested in um, adding value, right, being open, being vulnerable, and allowing everyone in this room to take a portion or a component of our conversation and put it into action. Mm -hmm. So what are like the one, two, or three like, you know, specific takeaways you'd like everyone to run out of here with a head of steam and a lot of hope and optimism <laughs> and, uh, and, and go improve their businesses in, in our broader community? What's the one thing I'd leave you with? Well, you know what I'm appreciating right now? Yeah. The one thing I really am appreciating right now is... It's a great time to be a frog. 12 and 0, baby. 12 and 0. <laughs> but seriously, it's also a great time to be in business. It's a great time to be at TCU. It's a great time to be in the state of Texas. I mean, I always, again, I look for opportunities and all the positives. Um, it's also an opportunity to have impact. Each and every one of you as a business leader has the opportunity to have great impact. And the fact that you're in this campus today, I have nothing but amazing things to say about TCU. It's not just a brand for me. Uh, for me, it's part of my family. Um, I've watched my daughter walk in as one individual and evolve to another. Uh, simple little things, like she used to never eat anything that swims. <laughs> now she eats sushi. She used to never want to talk, you know, an introverted. Now she's leading. Uh -huh. um, and I, I just see her evolve as a human being. And the learnings and the conversations I know are coming from her environment. Yeah. And TCU, um, for me, has been that environment. I, I am entrusting, when you entrust our next generation to TCU, I think we're in good hands. Yeah. Well, it's a decidedly special place. Yeah, that's absolutely. <laughs> It's a decidedly special place, and, uh, and, and obviously your investment of your time and insights has made this great place even greater. So I want to, again, so thank all fun. of our sponsors. I want to thank all of our students, our faculty, our staff, our business leaders for really allowing us to convene community to have one of the most impactful conversations in this series uh, history. Let's give it up for well, thank you. you. <laughs> All right, so from here, you better start your tailgate. Uh, we've got a game tomorrow. <laughs> Classes are canceled. Can I do that? That's I right, know. 24 hours, right? <laughs> right? All right, everybody, it's good to see you. Go Frogs. That was fun. That was so much fun.